Uh, I was wondering about you recording AI Lab on Fridays. Oh, I, yeah. I want to go to the last one. I couldn't. Yeah, yeah. So the last AI Lab I didn't record, unfortunately. I'm going to, but I will begin to record them. Before, I haven't been recording them because it wasn't um, wasn't quite as necessary, but it makes sense to begin recording them. So starting this Friday, um, especially if somebody reminds me, but I, I should be good to go with recording them. Um, so, but yeah, in principle, we should record them. There's no reason not to. Um, okay, yeah, Any anybody else? Did anyone else have any, anything to say? Yeah, uh, the links on the slide doesn't work. Uh, Which is there link? any way to get the slides uh, or the syllabus? Yes, I know. Yeah, the slides are broken because I had to move them from the Google Droplet. Um, I will, I will share. I will basically share these slides afterwards, and the, we'll we'll start using these slides anyway. The, the slides are updated, so it's it's better to just use the ones that I'm going to be sharing with you today. So I'll, I'll export these slides after the class, and I'll add them to the syllabus. So yeah. Okay. Any? Oh, yeah. But where's? Uh, I I didn't see the syllabus uh, the syllabus link on the ML. So as I uh, said, website. the the syllabus will be here, ITPS twenty. Right now it's not there. It's just uh, ITPS nineteen. Uh, I will put it up either today or tomorrow. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? No. Okay, then let's then uh, let's get back to the slides. Okay, so today the, what I what I'm gonna do is this segment. I usually I've done this for the neural aesthetic, and I did this for autonomous artificial artists. I like to do this kind of the whole class in sixty minutes. Um, now I put that into quotation marks for two reasons. Uh, one is that it's sort of the the you know the 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 sort of tagline for for the lecture, which is I'm gonna do a quick run through of everything this whole class is about what the point of it is, it's, it's probably one of the least concrete classes. Well, I don't know. I guess I shouldn't say that because I don't know all the classes at ITP, but maybe one of the most nebulous kind of abstract classes in, in, in the offering. And so it really pays to kind of like discuss what, what it is, what, you know, what this whole concept is about um, in a summary before, before digging deeper into each of the individual components. And then I also put it into quotation marks uh, because usually it takes more than 60 minutes. Uh, so it's sort of like it should be an hour long lecture. Um, I, but but usually when I try to pack a whole class into one hour, it'll it'll usually take more. I'm kind of aiming for one hour, in which case we will will be wrapping up early today. I'm guessing it'll go a little bit longer than that. Um, but but most likely we're going to be we're going to be kind of done the lecture before um, before. Uh, let's see, like probably probably by like before three, I, I imagine, but, but let's see kind of how things go. And um, just think keep in terms of keeping things interactive. Um, usually when we're in a classroom, of course, it's a little bit easier for people to raise their hands and for me to see them. Um, I would definitely want to uh, here on this. It, it's much easier for people to kind of fade into the background. I'd really love to, to try to keep this as interactive as possible. Um, and really the, you know, doing lectures in this format only makes sense when there's interaction. Um, and so um, I encourage you to to either I'm going to try to keep the chat window up so that I can see um, when people are, are saying anything. And also um, that, that's that's the kind of the fastest way to well, let's that's sort of the fastest way for for uh, for you to get a hold of me or you can just start speaking. There's a little bit of a lag. And so you might you know, it might be kind of awkward, like a few seconds go by. But. But definitely, like if anyone starts speaking, I'll I'll, I'll pause and, and just ask a question. There's really nothing, you know. This is a is a crazy class in some ways, and so like there's really nothing that you can say that'll make it crazier. And so I encourage everyone to just kind of like, um, you know, be as interactive as possible. Um, okay, cool. So another thing I sort of need to take care of is my battery. <laughs> so I need to plug this in really quickly. If you guys give me just. 30 seconds to find the plug. I'm going to do my best to do that really quickly. Hang on. Just kidding. 
something I'm going to have to take care of during the break because I, I can only find these two pronged ones in this room. It's one of the many gifts of like having to suddenly leave the place that you're that you were about to do the class in, but that's okay. Like, um, I think we should be okay until at least the break. I'm basically gonna start lecturing until until we reach the break, and then and then it uh, or, and and then and then we'll kind of we'll do like a maybe like a ten minute break, or usually take like a ten or fifteen minute break, and then we'll come back and finish it. Um, okay, so or until my battery dies, and then I'll and then I'll take care of the battery while we do the break. I think they'll happen r roughly at the same time. Okay, so. Um, so okay, so autonomous artificial artist. Okay, what 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 is this? So let me quickly just hide this. You guys can see the slides. Everyone can see the slides, right? And the the chat window. I'm just gonna kind of hide over here. Okay, so the basic idea of an autonomous artificial artist is that it is an artist. It is it's a generative art program whose behavior emerges from the collective intelligence of the network of participants who make it. I'm going to make a case later for why I for for why this is for why this is autonomous, right? Because it, it maybe doesn't necessarily uh, it, it may feel a little disconnected from this idea of autonomy. It's going to take me a little while to to kind of get to the connection between between this collective intelligence idea and autonomy. Um, and then the goal of the generative art program is to create unique and original artworks, right? So it's basically it's an AI artist. That, that's kind of the best way of putting it. It's this, and it very much follows from from almost decades now of of work by by artists and researchers and various people that have been interested in creating computational agents which generate art. And and maybe some of you are already familiar with some of these ideas. Think things things like Aaron stand out. Um, Harold Cohen's Aaron. I'm going to talk about that a little bit next week. Um, but there have been many. You know many projects in the space that have that have tried to use AI, use machine learning in some way to make interesting art, and then kind of then also make try to try to suggest that there is something autonomous, like almost like this is a living being, like an artificial life that's making its own art, that it's separate from from the author, and this is a little bit of a dream of of you know AI artists over the last you know few decades really. And uh, we'll talk about this collective intelligence idea. Um, and oops, yeah. Um, and then another thing about this. Now, there's there's kind of two major reasons why why this should interest you and why I'm interested in it. One is that it's connected to. One is the following point I'm going to make, which is which is a more abstract point. Now I'm going to make a more concrete point in the following slide. The idea of using collective intelligence to make to to uh, to make to basically applying collective intelligence to AI to make art is very much for me it's interesting because it it gets at something that I've been kind of loosely calling collective imagination and the what I mean by collective imagination is this um, there is a there has been for for a long time this I this concept in, um, of collective intelligence right so when we talk about the internet, we some pe you, people will talk about. There's this buzzword, collective intelligence. That there's a sort of intelligence, there's a sort of um, agency among uh, all of us connected to the internet that is a little bit separate from each of us, right? That the that the internet almost has its own mind, and we often use this language, even though it's a little bit like uh, it's a little bit highfalutin and and a little bit abstract. We we often use this language to describe things like uh, call a hive of bees you know so a colony of bees has what's called a hive mind and we often um, associate almost like a living form to the colony itself and we also have uh, the word a superorganism right a superorganism is is made up of many many smaller organisms which are acting in such amounts of cooperation that they appear to be uh, that the collective appears to be a single being, and uh, so the collective intelligence is is the analogous to that. It's basically all of uh, it's many intelligences, smaller intelligence, let's say, that are cooperating together very very tightly, such that the collective appears to have its own uh, own mind. Now this whole imagination aspect comes from one of the metaphors that we use to describe. Um, AI art arts programs, so generative models, 
um, you know, generative adversarial networks, GANs, autoencoders, these kinds of models, they, uh, we often talk about them as though they're imagining new things, right? They're using their imagination to, to imagine new kinds of dogs and cats and, you know, cars and things like that. And sometimes we say dreaming, um, but, but often we're kind of using these human level terms like imagination and dreaming. And the reason for that is, is, is kind of a technical reason. They, they sort of are imagining in a technical sense because, you know, a machine learning model, which has been trained on many millions of images of cats, has learned an internal representation of a cat. Um, and then it can sample new cats that don't exist. It can think of new images which weren't in the original data set. And that's what we do when we're imagining. If I ask you to imagine a cat, you're imagining a cat that doesn't actually exist. And you're doing it using your mental model of a cat, which has been trained on many millions of images of cats. And so I think the metaphor is, is an appropriate one. It's, a, it's an imagination. It's certainly imagine, imagination. And to the extent that this generative model is is trained on the inputs of many, many, many people, let's say, but but really it doesn't have to, have to even be people, but just many, many sources, um, there's a collective component to it. So it's this sort of like us collaborating on imagining, you know, a cat. And this screenshot is um, from Runway. We're going to use Runway a little bit next week. Um, this is this is an application. This is a generative model called Attention Gan. And uh, attention GAN is a text to image model, which takes a caption and then synthesizes an image which corresponds to that caption. So if you type into it, a woman is eating a delicious sandwich, you'll get something, uh, you'll get something like this, right? Um, I think a few new people have joined us, right? Um, uh, I think, well, I'll, I'll kind yeah, of- I just got the link in the email. Oh, okay, okay. A few of you, okay. Uh, my apology for those of you who um, did not get the link in the email. It seems that I didn't have everyone in my email list, so I apologize for that. But I'm going to let's. I'm gonna stay stay on the line, and after the lecture, I'll I'll, I'll kind of I'll add you to the attendance. Um, so okay, so I'm just gonna keep going to the lecture. We'll we'll deal with that in a little bit. Um, okay, so let me get the chat okay so now um so okay so attention again as i was saying attention again is this image as uh, text to image model and obviously now this doesn't look particularly <laughs> realistic but it's interesting to watch the neural network try to imagine this 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 scene that it has never seen before and uh of course like n you know we we laugh a little bit about these images but of course they're becoming increasingly realistic and the, and the ones that generate um images that are not coming from a caption of text are incredibly realistic now we'll see some of those next we'll especially talk about them next week and um, most likely these text to image models are going to get quite good as well and so there's um there's there's kind of an interesting thing that we're watching which is that the imagination of these neural networks is becoming much more uh, and more realistic and and evocative of of our own imaginations and so i'm, I'm really kind of I'm interested in this phenomenon and and this class is is partially ab about that um you know especially as you kind of apply this decentralization element the collect the collectiveness of it grows right because if it's decentralized then that means that it's not the imagination of any one person but it's the imagination of many and um we're going to talk a lot more formally about decentralization stuff probably in week three um, i'm going to talk about it a little bit um in the second half of this lecture but um, but more, but more getting into into next week. Um, so uh, I've been so just just on a personal note, I've been super interested in this idea for a long time. This is actually a project that I did in 2011, which is a little bit uh, going at the same idea. Um, so this is a project called the Color of Words, and what was done here was that for each of these words, um, I did I, I would perform a Google image search download uh, for each word, download a thousand images, associate, the first thousand images associated with that word, and then use uh, clustering algorithms to analyze the color distributions of those images, and then to, to use something called a self-organizing map, which is a, a machine learning algorithm, which is basically obsolete by now, but, but uh, back then was, was good at doing sort of two-dimensional data visualization. 
Um, I would use a self-organizing map to, to visualize the color distribution of the, those Google image searches. And so, you know, if you search for the words winter, you'll get a disproportionate amount of, of images from uh, that have, you know, white and light blue color schemes, right? And fall, you would get a lot of images that, that include things like orange and, you know, and then getting into more, um, more con you know, still kind of concrete words, things like desert would be very orange, right? And so it should kind of make sense that, that, that we associate these colors with these, uh, with these words. Uh, but you can even take this further and, and use abstract concepts. So I would put in things like holidays. Um, if you put in Christmas, for example, you'll get a lot of sort of red and blue colors and a little bit of white. Um, you know, if you put in St. Patrick's Day, you know, you'll get all green, right? Because, and that's just kind of, um, you know, we, we, green is often the color that we associate with St. Patrick's Day. And so, but, but then of course the word itself doesn't have a color. Um, nevertheless, we can, we can kind of use this, uh, we, can, we can arrive at colors, associate colors with those words by doing, um, by scraping many, many images that people have in, individually uploaded, associating them with those words. Um, so, you know, for, uh, and so this is kind of an early collective intelligence project. I was interested in, 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 um, you know, what, is there some sort of like a, you know, like, like almost a consensus among all of us about what these, what these concepts look like, what, what colors are associated with them. And so this is really a little bit like a much souped up version of that, of that idea. Um, now, um, the, I think there is, yeah. Okay. Now the, the idea, um, is a multi, so this idea of the autonomous artificial artist is, is very much multifaceted. Um, it, it, and it's not new. I, I kind of want to stress that this is, that this is in many ways an old idea in certain ways. Um, it is an idea that lies at the intersection, as far as I can tell, of four different fields. There is, of course, the computer art element. So we're interested in, in, you know, a comp uh, like programs that make, that make art, computational art. Um, of course, intersecting with artificial intelligence. And you could say that the intersection of computer art and artificial intelligence is, is very much the core of the neural aesthetic. So that class is all about this intersection between AI and computer art. And, um, but then this class um, is also adding in two other domains entirely. One is the, this idea of the decentralization. Here it's written as crypto economics. I think more, more generally, I would just say decentralization. Crypto economics is a term from the from the blockchain space, which is super interested in the economics of decentralization, and that's um, that's very much a component of this. Although it's not going to be a huge component of this class specifically, so I would just really actually think more of this as the decentralization bubble, and then um, and then there's this kind of philosophy of mind aspect to it. So for me, the the philosophy of mind aspect of it is. To, to what degree can you make a, you know, the question that's relevant to philosophy of mind is if you make a computer program which demonstrates these characteristics that I mentioned earlier, that it's original, that it's, that it makes unique works, that it surprises you, you know, that, that, that none of us are, that all of us are sort of surprised by what it makes and that it acts autonomously without permission of any of us, at what point does it become a mind, right? Uh, like, what is a mind? You know, what, what, what distinguishes this from a human mind, let's say? Um, and of course, like, not, if, you, if you're not interested in decentralization and computer art aspect, the centri the, this is a question that people often ask with, re with respect to the term superintelligence. So at the, center, at the intersection between philosophy of mind and, and artificial intelligence is this idea of superintelligence. So is a superintelligence, you know, is it, is it a mind or is it a, is it just a computer program, right? And there's really very little consensus about this. It seems like people have their own different ideas about it. And so I'm very much, and I don't necessarily have my own, you know, answers to this. I just know that it's an interesting question. And so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of broadly interested in it. Um, and in general, all of these fields have interesting areas that they're intersecting with. So if you look at computer art and philosophy of mind, there's a whole domain called artificial life, and, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about artificial life later today, um, which was a very active field in computer art through th from as early as the 80s. So the 80s through the 90s and today, people have been 
Um, computer artists have explored ideas of not just AI, but also things like biology and, and uh, mostly biology, like evolution, genetics, and things like that, to, um, to kind of create these artificial life forms that they would then run simulations with. And so there's a very rich history there that we're tapping into as well. Um, then, you know, between computer art and, crypt and decentralization, there's this whole crypto collectibles thing. This is a very, you know, th this was probably a hotter thing, like, let's say last year or two years ago, but still kind of an area of emerging interest. And, um, and then I've also run workshops that are kind of concerned with just de uh, decentralization AI, and that's your sort of decentralized AI. And we're going to talk a lot about decentralized AI in the third week. Um, and then when you add any three of these bubbles together, you start to get some weird areas that are much more contemporary. So the AI art is kind of the most familiar one to people. You know, this is combining the sort of computer art philosophy of minor AI. Um, and then some of these others may not be well known to you. So the idea of AI DAOs and art DAOs, I'm going to get into a lot during a little bit later today and a lot in, in week three. Um, and then, um, and the same thing for Cryptco. Cryptco is kind of the, the first attempt to, to, to merge any of these things a little bit with, with AI uh, or merge the decentralization and computer art with AI. And then the autonomous artificial artist is smack in the middle. Yeah, I think it's, it's all of these things. And so it's, um, it's a concept that's interested me for, for now a couple of years, even, even though I've made very slow progress on it. And so this class is really going to be unpacking that idea. Now, um, another question that I want to I want to address um, is why is this even why, why is this relevant now? You know, so so up until a few weeks ago, all of you know all of us thought we were going to be in this classroom together talking about art and ideas and things like that, and suddenly this whole coronavirus hit, and now we have this global catastrophe. And um, the thing is that that for me. The, um, this idea runs deeper than the art itself. And so I want to address this right now because I want to connect it very much to the, um, very much to the circumstances we, we, we are in. Um, and again, not just coronavirus, but even in the absence of coronavirus, you know, we're living in the age of climate change, worldwide debt, you know, um, planetary scale catastrophes. If someone sneezes in, if someone sneezes in some other part of the world, it could, it leads to a, a global catastrophe. And so like, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I want to stress that this that the idea of the autonomous artificial artist does not um, is not even really at a deeper level about the art it makes. It's it's about a generalization um, because um, and this this will make more sense later when we describe how it should work. But the mechanics of the art, art, autonomous artificial artist that I proposed uses um, uses a set of peer to peer technologies. So we want to use we want to use new technologies. Um, including, as I mentioned earlier, federated learning, multi-party computation, um, and, and other kind of decentralization technologies to get computers that are, that are peers with each other to cooperate over, over some, some kind of a high value, uh, high value uh, computation, right? And that, that's what the, uh, you know, in, in our case, it's an artist. So it's generating some artwork and maybe that artwork is valuable. But, but the thing is that this general this construction that we're going to that we're going to create generalizes very readily to um, any other any kind of um, network of peers that are cooperating over something valuable so they could be cooperating over something valuable in the medical space in which you know some degree of autonomy and privacy is very necessary to preserve they could be doing so in the financial space um, they can be doing so in 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 more ways than than certainly I can imagine, um, and so um, and so that's what this is sort of like very much getting at. I just noticed there's a question in the Zoom channel. Ah, can you elaborate? So Aditya asks, can you elaborate what you mean by trustlessly? Yes. Um, so in the in the decentralization world, trustless means that you can cooperate with some unknown unknown person or computer you know network without having to trust them. So, um, so this is used a lot in Bitcoin, for example, right? So when you, when you give, you, you can send a Bitcoin to somebody with um, trusting that this, um, trusting that all the peers that you don't know are not, are, are not going to um, screw you over somehow. And the reason why it's trustless is because we know that the mechanics of the system prevent, um, should prevent anyway, 
um, anyone from from do uh, from maligning it from um, that's that's a bad that's actually a bad explanation of trustless. Let me start that over. Trustless means you don't have to trust the system that you're cooperating with, right? So um, again, just going going back to the Bitcoin analogy, Bitcoin is a trustless system because none because uh, by the the way that the the way that it is designed. Um, it can withstand individuals being uh, malicious um, because the whole uh, it does not collapse under under uh, maliciousness of a few peers the whole system is sort of guaranteed to work because it is too expensive to be malicious essentially and so you can you can uh, you don't have to trust it to cooperate with it um, this again this will also become a little bit more clear when we talk about the uh, mechanics of decentralization especially with respect to machine learning um, which will be a little bit later today and, and in week three. Uh, but good question. Yeah, I didn't didn't um, didn't unpack that quite well. Anyway, um, going back to this this idea, um, I, I want everyone to sort of keep this in mind um, as we as we describe the idea, as we construct it. You know that that it's not ne it's not necessarily about making art. Um, it's about making make a, it's making um, some. Um, computation that generates value right and and in particular a high performance computation because because we've already solved the sort of low performance computation pretty well with blockchains but but blockchains don't don't really scale to, to anything like like high performance computation like machine learning and so we're gonna have to use new technologies for that um, some questions is you know so that this class will try to address is is how would such a network work um, how do the nodes that are involved in it govern it and and how do they ensure that it's benevolent so how do you ensure their decentralized system is is um, not doing harm and those are all super complicated questions and we're not going to really be able to answer them in this class because they're sort sort of open questions but we'll be able to maybe um, make some progress towards understanding certainly to understanding what doesn't solve them um, but also to understanding um, some of the strategies that people are thinking about in terms of making them um, uh, somewhat immune to um, to yeah to, to bad behavior. Um, and then I made this slide just before the class, and so that I, it may be a little bit under maybe a little bit undercooked. But but I, I kind of uh, like this this relationship between the two ways of looking at this course. The one is this autonomous artificial artist. And it, which is a, which is I, I say a concrete objective and an abstract concept. So what I mean by that is it's, it's concrete in the sense that uh, I can describe exactly what an autonomous artificial artist does. You know, it's a generative model that makes that samples images or sounds or texts. Uh, but it's abstract because it's an artist, and so you know, it's an artist is necessarily abstract. Uh, but then the the more abstract way of looking at the objective. Is that what what's behind the autonomous artificial artist is that it's really just a peer-to-peer uh, -peer network of people or or you know computer networks cooperating uh, to train jointly train a machine learning model which then they they then share together under some set of rules that they all agree to by consensus um, and so that's that's a much more that's much more concrete as a concept. Um, but now it's now we've abstracted it into into a way that would that that can generalize into other um, into other domains, right? So if it's a federated peer-to-peer -peer network that is um, running uh, that is making an art, art, autonomous artificial artist, that same construction, the federated peer-to-peer -peer network, can be used to power some decentralized um, applications of finance, some decentralized applications of of, of medicine, of public health. And so on, and and we'll talk about in, in in particular, you know, obviously now, especially with coronavirus, you know, like one of the things that that we're struggling with is is um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting um, medical research that can be done, a lot of interesting interesting things that 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 we could innovate with to to you know attack this virus, you know, biological innovations, but they're they're actually um, uh, it, it's actually a great difficulty to to do them, um, in particular in the U.S., but everywhere really, um, because of uh, privacy regulations, right? So because bio bio um, biomedical data 
is extremely sensitive. Um, it's, it's very private. It's, of course, very um, important for people to have privacy controls in biomedical data. Certainly that, you know, like for, from the standpoint of, of a patient doctor relationship, but really also on a global scale. And um, one of the really interesting applications of this area is um, one of the interesting applications of the, these technologies is that you can possibly do machine learning on data which remains private. And this is kind of breaks a, um, a way of, uh, you know, a dichotomy that people assume always exists. That if you want to do research on people's data, you have to necessarily give up privacy. And one of the interesting things about some of these technologies that we're going to look at is that you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, and then if you don't have to do that, if you can actually do these kinds of computations without compromising privacy, how does that affect um, how does that affect uh, areas in which privacy is such a premium that it basically disables research? Um, and, and of course, now more than ever, is that super relevant? Uh, Gil asks, does federated imply democratic? Um, I would say that, that um, so I, I, would, I would probably, personally, I think I should, we should decouple those words because it, uh, a federated system is not necessarily democratic. Um, and, and a democratic system is not necessarily federated. Um, federated really just means that the, that the nodes are essentially autonomous from each other and they're cooperating somehow um, in, in some kind of a federation. But, um, and and, may, and, and I, I would say that maybe it, it is kind of useful or, or even necessary possibly for, for a democratic system, uh, but it's not sufficient, right? So federated does not, is not sufficient for, for democracy. I would say, but but it's it's a hard question to answer because it depends a little bit on the details. It depends a little bit what we mean by democratic, um, and so I, I and so I would stress to maybe decouple them. But um, but it's a it's a good question. It's it's hard to say. Um, okay, so so that was the that was the sort of meta. Um, meta about this. Let's just see how, how my, oh, my battery is terrible. Okay. So how about this? Oh, and then we're actually about, we're close to halfway through the class. So let's do this. Um, let's take a 10 minute break. Like, or let's, let's return here around 140 and, um, uh, sorry, 340. Um, sorry, no, 440. I'm getting my time zones confused. I'm really sorry. 440 will return. Um, and, um, in the meantime, I'm going to try to set up my battery here. And, um, and yeah, and then we'll kind of get going back with the lecture. Okay, so uh, let's be back here at 440. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and we'll be back soon. The recording has stopped. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, 141, uh, 441, so people should be, should, should be getting back pretty soon. Hope everyone's had their, had their afternoon coffee. Uh, before, before beginning, getting back to lecture, I wanted to check in on the new people who joined us. I think a few, a few people just joined us. I'm going to, I'm going to actually see if I can find you all. Hold on a second. Um. Uh, there's uh, is it Julia Myers? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I think for some reason, Astra, are you Juju Myers? Is that right? Uh yeah, I suppose. Okay, but great. Whatever works. <laughs> uh, did you you didn't get my original email with the Zoom link? Is that correct? No, I didn't. I got an email from Dante. Like, um, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's whatever, that's my whatever, mistake. Whatever time I join, I don't yeah, I must have been. So I've been emailing the same list for the last few weeks. It must have updated like after the registrar. So I just didn't have you on there. But I'll I'll add you to the email list. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. One second. Um... Um, I also see. Uh, Olivia is there, right? Olivia? I'm 
maybe she has yeah. Yeah? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and you, you also, I, I suppose, didn't get the email, is that correct? Yeah, I didn't get the email. Okay, okay. Okay, sorry about that. You'll you'll be added. And then is Marina there? Did Marina come? Oh, yeah, Marina? Yes, yeah. Only... Hey, Marina. Um, yeah, I also only got Dante's emails. But okay, numbers. gotcha. Okay, so now everyone's joined. That's great. No one's absent today. Uh, for the for the three of you who joined um, join later, I'm really sorry about the email mix up. I just didn't have the up to date email list, but I'll add you guys. I'll add everyone to the email list, and um, and start so following all future emails. And this is this Zoom link will work. It should work if I if I understand correctly. It should work for for all of these, uh, for all of our sessions. Um, maybe before we start, can you you guys tell me uh, like what year are you? Um, um, so I'll start with Marina. Like, what year are you? What are you? What are your focus areas at ITP? And any previous experience with machine learning? Um, so I, I actually go to NYU Shanghai, uh, and I'm oh. a senior doing IME. Um, yeah. So I was supposed to be in Shanghai this semester, but then mm -hmm. campus they're closed. So then I went to New York, and that's how I ended up enrolling in your class. Um, mm -hmm. And I've I've never done machine learning. Um, but I would say I've mostly spent my time in IME doing creative coding, um, and audio visuals mostly. Okay, great. Cool. And, uh, Ju uh, Julia, Juju? Is it Ju- should I go by Juju or Julia? <laughs> uh, you could do what either. Juju's fine. Um, yeah, I'm actually the same, in the same position. I'm in NYU Shanghai. I'm a senior. Um, so yeah, it's the same position, but actually last semester I did, I took a class called AI arts. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Um, AI arts. But, um, yeah, it was very interesting. It was very fun. Sorry. Oh, no, no, I'm not familiar. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's at the Shanghai campus, but, okay. um, yeah, it was a great introduction. Um, and I really enjoyed like doing deep dream stuff, um, was like, was my focus, but, um, but yeah, I'm really excited to learn more about. AI art. Yeah. Okay. Great. Cool. Um, and then, uh, last but not least, um, Olivia. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm a second year. Um, I don't really have like a focus on one thing. Um, so I'm just kind of here. Um, but, uh, I took, um, one of the uh like identity classes last semester uh which i think was taught by like uh dan and another runway uh person but i forgot his oh, name oh yeah and Anastasis, that's right the, yeah uh mm -hmm. and that's the only um machine learning that i've done yeah. okay cool and so you did a lot of, a little bit of runway stuff with it right uh I used runway and then I did like fast uh, transfer uh, styles like my on my own. Okay, cool. Um, okay, great. Well, welcome to the class. Um, for those who who came in a little bit late, I am recording the lecture, so so all of it. If you missed anything, it'll it'll be available afterwards. Um, so. So um, so yeah, and uh, and I'll kind of at some when I when I basically after um, after the class at some point. Hopefully today, if late, latest tomorrow, I'll get the syllabus updated, the um, link to the to the video updated, and then also some information about how we'll how we'll meet next week, um, whether or not I'll do a pre-recording or anything like that. Um, we'll we'll kind of see it depending on how how this goes today. Um, over the break, I got a question from Aditya, so I'm just going to read this out to everybody. Um, so I don't, uh, DTA asks, I don't know if it will be addressed eventually, but a question I have is how do we resolve the ownership of a federated system for a purpose such as regulation or liability? If someone was to sue the federation, what would be, what would the liability of each individual node be? Can an individual node try to sell the artwork? Um, I'm especially thinking of a context such as healthcare, since you mentioned it, where protections are so much tighter. So it's a, for, it's a great question. And it's, it's a, it's a question that, Unfortunately, we won't be able to fully solve over the course of this class for two reasons. One is because it's a it's an open question, so the, so um, it, it, there's not really any um, very 
con you know there's 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 certainly lots of um, thinking in this space but there's definitely not any like uh, any solutions yet partially because the technology itself is so underdeveloped and so there hasn't been a lot of thought into it uh, outside especially among legal professionals because legal professionals have to deal with um, legal questions that are relevant to existing you know t t questions not speculative ones so there's still a lot to, to say about that a second reason why we won't fully answer is because it's somewhat out of the scope of this class um, so like when you talk about these federated decentralized systems and then you throw in things like AI and computer art you're starting to get a lot of um, a lot of stuff that's relevant to the class and unfortunately you just can't cover all of it and I'm, I'm personally not not particularly schooled in in questions of, of you know legal 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 questions and liabilities I'm very interested in them because of course it's very relevant to to this construction and so I'm 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 kind of I have some knowledge and I'll, and I'll actually try to answer it in a little bit just now uh, right now um, but for the most part it's it's something that that I can't really competently answer in much concrete details what I can say about it is um, so first of all, uh, the, I'll answer the last question first. Can an individual node try to sell the artwork? So um, in the, in for an autonomous artificial artist, if we do it right, then no. Um, actually, an individual node cannot sell the artwork, um, or, or at least not uh, the um, nodes that are. So so the the idea would be that you can only make an artwork with the cooperation of the whole network, and so then you can attach whatever rules that you want to it so it could be that the only entity which is able to sell the artwork is the whole network itself um, an individual node could buy uh, could buy the artwork that's different um, in, any individual should be able to buy the artwork but to, but it, um, but it should prevent any individual node for, from selling the artwork because the individual node will not be able to uh, will not have the whole model to themselves at any given time um, and and I'll um, that may, uh, we haven't yet gotten into the mechanics of how, uh, or, or how that would be. So we'll, we'll address that later. Um, but for, but that's, that's the short answer to that question. Um, and then the question of liabilities, it's a, yeah, it's like I said, it's a really open question. Like how does a decentralized system have liabilities? So one thing that, that I'm, you know, that, that might help us a little bit is that other people are already figuring this out, right? So, you know, there, there's a question for Bitcoin, right? So what is the liabilities involved in Bitcoin or Ethereum? Um, it's, as far as I can tell, it's pretty cloudy. It's, it's pretty gray area. I think in some cases there just isn't, um, there, there, there sort of isn't, it's a little bit lawless in some places. Now, I think laws are coming. The more that these things are regulated, the more that we figure out we come to some we come do we we arrive to some answers now in theory if the artist is if this artist is an entity itself then the artist itself like this network the autonomous artificial artist could itself be liable now how does it what is it how does it work when when a non-human entity is liable for something well we already have that in some in some to some extent with corporations corporations are non-human entities which are liable for damages and so maybe some of that law can can kind of can translate into the case of a decentralized network um, but it doesn't tra it translate seamlessly of course because because now the decoupling from humans is even more um, is even more apparent because at least corporations have have you know CEOs and boards and governors and stuff that 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 might be responsible for it to some degree um, with 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 a decentralized federated system that's that's even less so and so um, it could be that you can punish the punish the um, the entity itself you know maybe the autonomous artist is sort of banished and then maybe that the, then there's kind of there are ways of punishing in the blockchain space financially so you know an entity that is is staking money into something could 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 lose it um, you know if they misbehave and so I imagine that there there are um, so you know there are things that can be done in that direction. I don't know exactly what though. It, it, it starts to get into some really heady territory, and I'd be I'd be very curious to to get you know to to hear from somebody who does have a little bit more knowledge in the space how how it might work um, because because it's it's I would say it's it's still pretty yeah it's still a pretty unclear idea. But, um, but yeah, I hope that I hope that kind of answers your question. Very good question. Um, 
And um, is anyone else any other any other questions? You can feel free to just speak if you if you have something on your mind. You can also type it uh, before we get to the slides. Okay, so okay, so I guess I'm I'm gonna go ahead and keep going. Just as a reminder, like make sure, like feel free, like I said, like the this is really nice. I think the chat works pretty well during the. I always keep an eye on the chat, so if you have a question that pops up, feel free to type it into chat, and you can also just like interrupt me on the microphone. That also works fine. Um, don't worry about the little two second delay. We'll, I'll, I'll, I can always stop. Um, um, okay, so. So now, um, so okay, so I'm, uh, I believe I'm still recording, so pause, stop recording, so that means the recording's going, my video is on, everybody hears me, um, and the video's going, so good, I'm gonna get back to sharing the screen, and we'll go back to the slides. Okay, so I think you all should see my screen now, I'm also gonna pull up the chat window. Okay, so leave the chat window here and get back to slides. Okay, so uh, we we ended the first section with this idea of the of the concept, and we discussed this. The, this this I know this this um, is a little bit of an abstract slide, but but the the idea is that that I'd like to, for everyone to sort of keep in the back of their head while we're going through this class is that. An autonomous artificial artist is just a specific use case for a more general uh, framework or a more a more general set of technologies that can be used to to um, uh, well, which which can be described as a federated or a peer to peer network. Those two things are not exactly the same, but let's just say you know federated peer to peer decentralized network that are cooperating together to jointly train a machine learning model which they share and, and and I'll describe what I mean by share later um, we'll, we'll get into the again the mechanics of it much more in week three um, but um, when we introduce uh, a lot of these like like the the core um, decentralization tech the specific technologies we'll describe what we mean by sharing but but just from a from a sort of like high level like a high level um, view of it, sharing means that you know they they own it together. They can only use it together, and they can they cannot individually, um, you know, they can't copy the model. They can't they can't co-opt it. Um, it can only be used in the context of this shared enterprise that they have. Um, and there are ways of enforcing that technologically, and we'll get into the, those um, later in the class. Now, um, so. And actually, not not just later in the class, but but even a little bit. We're gonna even get into it a little bit in in the next few slides. I'm gonna describe a little bit these technologies, at least in the in the high level um, in a high level way, and then we'll we'll unpack them much more um, in the following weeks. Basically, the following two weeks, especially week three. Um, now, um, I like to start. Um, I, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and um, start by talking a little bit about the internet. And, and we're gonna talk about the internet because it's going to, uh, the whole point of, uh, of this, these next few slides is to bring up the problems that we're trying to solve. And the problems are very much native to the internet. They, they, don't, exact, they don't exist quite in the same way um, in, in uh, meat space, as we call it. Um, in cyberspace, you have both the problem of networks and the solution of networks. And, um, and of course the biggest network is the internet and, and I, I want to kind of um, start by pointing out some, some things that we're finding to be a problem with the internet. And I, I really love this um, cartoon or <laughs> this, uh, this is a tweet from someone on Twitter named Daryl Ginn who basically made a little parody video of every website and this was made in 2018 but it's still the case in 2020. So this is an animation of how every website in the world works in uh, as of 2018.
that's it. <laughs> so I really, I really enjoy this video because it, it, it kind of, does everyone find this familiar? So each of these, you know, these nuisances that we see on every website that we visit right now. So, you know, you get notifications, you like ad block ups, you have to sign up for things, you have to, you know, accept cookies, you have to sign up for some kind of a subscription plan. Then there's a little chat bot that's annoying you, then the thing doesn't even work in Chrome, then you have to share in social media. It's just really, really awkward to use pretty much every website in the world right now. So, um, so this is, this is kind of every website ever right now. Um, now, um, well, let me, let me kind of get back to this. So first of all, like wh why, um, why is the internet, everyone here is old enough to remember the internet from five to 10 years ago. Um, why does the internet have so many, uh, so like, why does every website have so many of these pop-ups coming up, annoying us before we just enjoy the content? Um, well, it's a, it's a, it's a hard question to answer, uh, because it feels like there's a lot of things, right? But I, I think there's a macro answer we could give, which kind of explains all of them. It, the, and the answer is that the biz, the predominant business model of the internet is, doesn't work right. In my opinion and in the opinion of many other people. And it, it's kind of been corrupted a little bit. So it, it the way, what we've gotten used to is that when you go to a website, you get it, you get all of its services for free. Um, and, and, you know, maybe you pay for that in looking at advertisements. And that, that's basically how websites work now. There's kind of some advertising, there's some kind of relationship between the consumer and the website that says, you know, you can use this service for free because provided that we show you advertisements. And, um, and this kind of worked for a little while, but um, but it really, first of all, um, gets away from from the way that real value transactions work in the real world. Usually, when you pay, when you when you get a service from some somebody or something, you pay for that service specifically. Um, but in the internet, you pay for a derivative of that service, right? So the advertising is sort of one step evolved from that, from removed from that transaction. And really, usually it's even more than one step removed because advertising networks have become very, very complicated. So now there's sort of like um, multiple uh, levels of hierarchical organization of advertising networks that um, that are extremely complicated and, and difficult to understand, somewhat irrelevant for us to understand. The, the, the point is that the that the uh, transaction is is not, you know, you cannot really get the service for free. Of course, no, no website could actually operate that way. And so over time, the internet has become littered by by little gotchas and snafus to make sure that you click into the right place, right? That you either have a subscription model to get to get out of the advertising or that you basically uh, accept uh, tracking. And, and the thing about tracking, of course, is that, you know, it's meant to provide you better, more relevant advertising, but, um, but we know by now, certainly in the post Snowden era, post GDPR era, that um, tracking goes well beyond giving you more relevant advertisements. It goes to uh, compiling large databases of personal information about people, which they are, would be very reluctant to give up if they knew that they were actually doing that, and um, which and, and information which becomes extremely powerful in aggregate. And what websites figured out is that this transaction favors them. So because for you as a consumer, you know, for you to give just a little bit of data uh, doesn't seem like a big deal because, you know, what is one piece of data by itself? Almost meaningless. It's like a pixel. You know, what is what is one pixel? Nothing, right? Basically, it's it's useless by itself. But many pixels give you a whole picture. And it's very much the same with data. A lot of low level meaningless data, which looks um, insignificant in value at the beginning actually turns out to be extremely valuable in aggregate. And it's so val and it's valuable almost in an exponential sense that the more data you get, the value of it grows by orders of magnitude and makes for companies that collect this data to be the richest companies in the world e eventually, the, at least the most powerful companies and soon to be the richest companies as well. Um, right now we're in a we're living in an age in which Google and Facebook account for 70% of advertising revenue, I think, in, in the internet, something like that. 
which is unprecedented. And that's so that's two CEOs which which have enormous um, influence over the entire sort of information delivery content management system of the internet. Now another another problem with with uh, websites is that because they're based on advertising, they are um, they they essentially get paid by clicks by by attention. So all of these websites are uh, competing for the attention of consumers, and of course consumer attention is extremely scarce now it is because there's a lot more information than there are of us to consume it, and so there is this kind of race to the bottom for companies to tailor their services around getting as many clicks as possible. And, and often we, we all sort of agree that it degrades the quality of their services. So, you know, there you have these, you have this phenomenon of clickbait and you have the phenomenon of fake news and you have the phenomenon of like, you know, advertisements that are very misleading. And it's all because these they they the companies are incentivized to give you that kind of stuff because they get paid more the more of your attention they consume and to consume someone's attention you can you can the best way to consume someone's attention is to make them anxious so that that's kind of one thing we figured out in the last few years is to give them bad news and make them anxious and that it, it turns out that people have inbuilt mechanisms, psychological mechanisms to react very strongly to negative attention grabbing information, much more so than positive grabbing information. Because, you know, why would we react to something positive? Everything's working right now. That's positive. No one cares. You're, you're, a, you're a machine that's made to survive. And to survive means that you need, that you need mechanisms that, uh, that capture, grab all of your attention when something bad is happening, like a predator is eating you. And so in, in humans, for humans, that translates into uh, reacting to things that, 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 that make us either angry or anxious or, um, you know, or what have you. And so now it really feels like the internet has become polluted by this, you know, that, that companies are basically realize that the best way to, to uh, grab your attention is to make you angry. And now we're finding out that a lot of people more and more are beginning to think that this doesn't, this doesn't, isn't the right way to to frame this value exchange. Maybe it would be much better if companies had to compete for uh, end goals that users specified. So that would be maybe an improvement. And so maybe that's something that we can actually do. And a lot of you know a lot of interesting projects in the in the in the blockchain space. You know maybe something like Brave Token, which, which we're not going to talk about, but but you know just to mention very you know briefly. Um, are uh, or the basic attention token, something like that, are are, are actually trying to um, are trying to flip this this model a little bit and saying that maybe it makes sense to pay for services directly, and that maybe even better that you can create um, you can cre you can try to create a positive alignment of 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 incentives that a website should should profit more if they give you really what what's good for you. And what's good for you is something that you decide for yourself, um, and and maybe maybe that's something that you can build into the internet. So that's kind of the state of the internet today. Now, uh, why is this relevant to the class? Um, we'll we'll get into that. I, I wanna I wanna quickly um, I wanna uh, qu quickly first connect this to to the distinction between uh, like centralized systems and decentralized systems, and then we'll get into why this is relevant for the kinds of networks that we'll be constructing in this class. So um, I think one problem, uh, maybe maybe you can you can argue that this is sort of the root cause of this, this uh, incentive disalignment is the fact that the way the internet works is predominantly server client based. So on the left side, this diagram, the server, server feeding computers, you know, and this could be your Google or this could be your Facebook, is the dominant paradigm of cooperation over services on the internet. And the problem, you know, the, and, and maybe the, you could say that, that maybe, you know, one, one problem with this model is that the server and the client have sort of different responsibilities. They have different responsibilities. They, they um, receive and transact value differently. And so they have different incentives, right? And so there, there's perpetually a tension between what the server wants and what the clients want. 
the server you know wants to maximize attention the clients want to maximize the value of the services they receive you know for for minimum payment let's say and there's this tension between the server and the client that leads to an arms race between them to uh to, to basically you know tilt the system in their own favor and right now servers are winning right and servers are winning because you can see that the tech companies are becoming the most valuable companies on earth and very much at the cost of privacy and the, at the cost of, of of certainly good having good feelings while browsing the internet um to say the least um and then you know if it were reversed that if the if the clients were winning then you have a different problem which is that servers you know the tech companies would basically die and then you wouldn't really have any services on the internet right so the the this is kind of the abstract way of of making a case for why a peer-to-peer -peer network might actually be uh better in this uh well it, it well let, let's just say before we say that it's better let's just say that it at least maybe solves this problem now it introduces its own new problems and that's that's you know that that may be an argument against peer-to-peer -peer networks but certainly they they get rid of the tension that it that happens when different nodes in the uh, in the, the network have different ways of interfacing with it so now the, in the peer to peer network everyone is the same everyone has the same way of interfacing with it perhaps what used to the responsibilities that used to belong to the server are now belong to each of the peers now all of them are are participating in the uh, in serving content and and therefore they essentially are both the servers and the clients and therefore they have the all the exact same incentives as each other so now there's there's a different equilibrium that's 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 reached because essentially everyone essentially what you you at least don't have this this kind of friction between these disincentives i think that maybe that's the 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 best way to explain the connection between uh th this kind of you know content delivery and 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 the problems that we see in the internet now i don't i don't know to say that the peer-to-peer -peer networks alone would solve the problems that we have um on the internet but they would certainly i think probably help and so there's that's kind of an interesting connection to there there's a lot of projects that we will probably maybe briefly mention um later in the course that are very much relevant to to just this for the internet so for those of you who are familiar with ipfs um those are ipfs is kind of like a project that i'm pretty interested in it's a project that's trying to essentially create a uh, a decentralized internet uh decentralized internet content delivery decentralized internet database decentralized um you know basically removing this idea that that to get content you have to log on to so and so website and have the content beamed to you from them uh, it could be that we sort of share the content and the software is an abstraction that lives um, that lives through throughout the network instead of being hosted in one server so um, so yeah that's that's kind of the idea of peer-to-peer -peer networks peer-to-peer -peer networks have existed for a long time um, people are probably already familiar with some of these so you you're probably familiar with Napster um, I think a lot of us you know can remember using Napster to download music for free back in the 90s um, or whenever that was maybe early 2000s um, a more modern version of that is BitTorrent, so people are probably familiar with BitTorrent. Um, for those of you who have ever been to Berlin, Berlin, or or actually in Germany in general, there's a an internet, basically like a wireless network, um, uh, it's a, it's a community driven um, peer to peer network for internet services called Freifunk. Um, there's something like that in New York in New York City as well. Um, then then more modern versions of this there's mastodon which is which is not decentralized exactly but, but or, and but it's a federated uh, federated version of Twitter um, then there's diaspora which is which is kind of died out but was originally supposed to be a decentralized version of Facebook and all of these pre-exist uh, blockchain so peer-to-peer -peer networks are certainly nothing new um, we've had these for for a long time and they very much grew in response to the centralization of the internet because the internet was not designed to be centralized it was designed to be decentralized um, it's just that the original architecture of the internet could not have envisioned um, large-scale tech companies and social media and, and things like that and so the the technology stack that they made to um, 
to prevent centralization essentially eventually failed. Um, it eventually kind of, you know, the, the floodgates were too much for these mechanisms to prevent centralization. And so we're kind of in this, in this stage where it makes sense to maybe revisit those, um, to revisit the architecture and think about, maybe think a little bit about how, how it might be able to be adequately improved. Um, so, um, so, so okay. So now, getting moving on from from peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks into into the more modern version of this, in the age of blockchains, now now there's been this concept floating around called decentralized autonomous organizations. And again, we're not going to talk about decentralized autonomous organizations in much detail today. Um, when we get into um, when we get into the in, into Two weeks from now, when we talk about some of the, the decentralization stack that I'm interested in, in, in sort of using, um, we'll talk about it in more detail. But for, for today, at least, I want to introduce them. And the idea of a decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO, I'll just call it a DAO from now on. So DAO or DAO. Um, DAOs are, are um, they're not a perfectly well-defined concept, right? But, but, um, but I'm going to try to kind of, um, articulate a little bit about how how people mean it so far. Um, a DAO is a, um, a, a a computer network which many people coordinate over a peer to peer network which many people coordinate over, which is distinguished from a from a simple peer to peer network like like Napster or BitTorrent, in in one respect, which is that it um, has some concept of of uh, value which can be transacted between them that can be measured like a currency or a set of scarce assets um, in BitTorrent and Napster none of this exists you just have copies of files um, and so you can't use Napster you can't put a currency into Napster it doesn't work at least not in a decentralized way um, another aspect of decentralized or uh, times organizations is that the contracts the sort of rules that govern it can be baked into it by putting it into a blockchain where the smart contract cannot be interfered with. And so you have a way of taking legal structures and placing them online and having them be enforced essentially by themselves and then allowing people to interact with each other through it in, in the sense that they all understand the what the rules do and do not do for them and uh, they do not need any third party to to kind of govern it for them. And um, so so you might say that Bitcoin by itself is an example of this. A lot of people don't necessarily uh, agree to that because maybe they think that Bitcoin is too simple. Um, but many but in the Ethereum, the world of Ethereum and, and this, this class is not going to be so much about Bitcoin and Ethereum. So I, I'm not going to take too much time to introduce them. Um, but for those of you who are following this world, you might know that in the Ethereum ecosystem, there are many projects that are trying to create DAOs, um, which have different functions. Um, a lot of them are, they're mostly concentrated in, in decentralized finance, but there is, there is a promise that they may um, take on applications outside of financial applications in, 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 the, in the near future. And, you know, we, we don't know if that's true or not, but, um, but, but it's, it's certainly, feels like a possibility, at least possible in principle. I don't know if it'll work out that way, but it's 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 kind of what we have. Now, um, the reason why I bring up DAOs is that um, a DAO is, um, so in the name, you have this name, Decentralized Autonomous. So there's this, there's an interesting relationship between the idea of decentralization and autonomy. And it's very, very crucial to understanding the concept of an autonomous artificial artist. Uh, because first of all, an autonomous artificial artist, this construction that we'll be will be building up over the course of the of this of the semester, is a DAO. It's a special case of a DAO um, with a few extra things added in, and so it's important to understand a little bit what a DAO is. And to understand what a DAO is, we we have to understand. Um, so we understand the decentralized part already. So what is what do we mean by autonomous? So the idea of autonomous. Um, the word literally means kind of, you know, for something to to have its own agency. So something is autonomous if it acts on its own behalf independently. So um, 
Bitcoin is is autonomous. You could say Bitcoin is an autonomous enterprise because it's not managed by some some you know actor. Some some um, you know it's not managed by um, it, it. It basically is its own. In uh, well, it's, this is very typical, isn't it? Um, so uh, autonomous in the sense that no no individual or group of individuals have are able to puppeteer it. You know, so a puppet is not autonomous because the puppeteer is pup is is moving it around, right? And so, in you can get autonomy through decentralization because decentralization implies that no individual um, operates it. Instead, it's operated jointly by many individuals, and its autonomy emerges from that. Right, it's an. I would say it's kind of an emergent phenomenon. It emerges in the sense that that you know you can that that you can that it's uh, that its autonomy seems apparent to us that it's sort of observed phenomenon. I know this is this is probably one of the most abstract things that we can that we can really um, you know talk about in this class. And and so I might even want to like assign readings that make this case between decentralization and autonomy because I'm not always good at making it. But um, but this is an idea that that's gained traction since since this concept of DAO started floating around in 2016 or 2017, the emergence of autonomy from decentralized systems, um, of which you know these DAOs that are in the Ethereum ecosystem are probably the best existing examples, and will and will probably I think maybe at some point in this class I'm not sure for how long but at some point we may introduce a few of them. Okay. So now let's talk about machine learning with respect to centralization and decentralization. Uh, oops, oops, sorry about that. Uh, play. Okay. Um, now in in with machine learning, before we talk about central uh, decentralized machine learning, let's talk about centralized machine learning, um, and and the problems of centralized machine learning. So first of all, what what do we what is centralized machine learning? So centralized machine learning is basically almost every existing machine learning system that we interact with today. Most machine learning is kind of done over the internet and it works in the following way. Some company, let's call it AI Incorporated, and you know that's Google or Facebook or Amazon or Apple or, or Uber or whoever, is offering some service and they use machine learning to make that service operate better. You know, they, they maybe um, they, they have this value proposition that by collecting a lot of data, they're able to learn something very intelligent from that data and then use it to either inform or improve an existing service of theirs. And the, the me mechanically, it works like this. User population agrees to send their data. That's what these disks represent. These are databases. This is the standard way of... of um, of drawing it it's like a database symbol so they send their data sets to ai incorporated ai incorporated uses their data to train a machine learning model to provide a service better and then they send that service to the user um, and i've i've somewhat sheepishly denoted that service as a cat because you know that service i'm, I'm not trying to be funny it's it's actually just kind of well it's maybe a little bit of a swipe at the tech companies but what they provide us is pictures of cats videos and pictures of cats that's kind of mostly what facebook and amazon and apple are for and i'm just i'm being a little funny but but the point is that it, what they don't send us is money um, they send us a service that that is maybe improved which is streaming cat videos um, but but then the but then there's no money exchanged between you and the the company right so there's no money exchange on the left side of this diagram the, and so who's paying for this? Well, the deal is that AI Incorporated is able to, to then sell the model or access to the model or the raw data itself to third parties and then get paid for it. And that's, um, and therein lies the, this you know, sort of two-step business model that the reason why you never have to exchange any money with the services you use in the internet is because it's just one step removed. There's there's some um, 
third party that is is kind of or multiple third parties that are interested in this data and so then this is kind of the the fair exchange right now um but the problem is like um well yeah oh let's okay yeah so so let me let me kind of do this in order so before i talk about problems with this system let's just let's just review some of the applications of centralized machine learning um applications of machine learning especially you know with internet applications of machine learning they're they're all over the place right climate prediction uh public health you know like i said i was talking about this earlier public health is a really big one and very relevant right now um robotics you know training training robots through video games computer vision uh finance then you know this idea of resource allocation and administration so optimization of scarce resources can be done um, can be also framed as a machine learning problem so obviously a lot of the most important applications of the day are very much relevant to machine learning now what's the now the problem with centralized machine learning it, there's a number of problems right so one is that by putting all the data into one place it's a massive target for hackers and I think you know everyone's probably gotten tired by now over reading of all of the breaches of security that have uh, you know occurred to major tech companies over the last five to ten years um, so I, I I don't even have a good list of them I, I remember you know Yahoo leaked three billion email accounts or something like that um, there's been major breaches at at, at Sony um, the, and other social I, I had a list prepared but I can't even find it right now there's been obviously everyone knows there's been tons of breaches and you know the companies don't necessarily take security very seriously but even if they did it's it's just a really really hard thing to get around the fact that you have this gigantic stash of extremely valuable data and so it's it, it becomes only a matter of time before someone can can um, can either breach it or or corrupt it or or you know do something else malicious to it and this is, you know, of course, this is not as true for decentralized systems. Decentralized systems are fault tolerant. That means there's not one central point of failure. That maybe one of the nodes can fail, but not the whole system. And in centralized systems, you have one central point of failure. So that's that's a major that's a major issue. Um, then another issue is that you have this perpetual tension over the privacy of data. So, you know, companies that transact in your data have have are always, you know, they always want your data more permission to use your data in ways that you may otherwise object to. And um, and of course, like the users would rather that the data would be entirely private. Maybe, you know, maybe they care about some things more than others, but they're generally not interested in, in companies using their data. And so you have this perpetual conflict between companies and users over the privacy of data and that leads to people being bombarded with 50 page long contracts um, you know terms of service agreements that they that no one reads right so I remember um, a few years ago I remember reading uh, someone did a study that basically concluded that if you were to read all of the terms of service agreements that you agree to on a, 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 you know per year you would have to take one month off from work a year just to do nothing but read terms of service agreements so now I imagine that nobody does this right so you just sort of yeah and so so obviously like something is wrong with this system it's like we're 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 signing up to agreements that we don't know what, what they actually what they actually contain and even if we did read them we may we may not even understand them because they're they're extremely cryptic um, and so this is kind of just a perpetual problem the third point here is conflicts of interest over user objectives so I, m I mentioned earlier that websites are aligned to capture your attention even if it makes you angry or upset or 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 you know or anxious um, and and really what we want from from social media is to uplift us right or to or to um, you know m put forward our objectives for for whatever it is that we want you know some people want to be healthier some people want to be more social whatever it is that you want to use the internet for to get information that's useful to you um, you know those are our true objectives and um, they're not exactly the same as um, you know they're correlated because you know the websites obviously they to the extent that they service us they they get more of our returning attention back 
but they're not quite the same. And so this disalignment leads to, leads to harm. So then the fourth point is there are many valuable applications that require uh, data that's too sensitive. I mentioned this earlier, we were talking about you know, the, the idea of public health applications that would use medical or biomedical data, um, which could be enormously beneficial. Um, you know, obviously for doing something like building vaccines or, or understanding wh what people are, are most likely to uh, get illness from, from, you know, viruses. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, and I'm certainly myself, I'm not in the, in the medical space. And so I can't speak in too much detail about this, but I can say with certainty that um, these things are slowed down by by privacy regulations. And of course, the privacy regulations are there for good reasons. Uh, we've observed that, that, that if you do not give people adequate privacy, that, they, that their data is abused. Um, and, so, and so this is kind of like, a, you know, you're, we're stuck between two problems. If you, if you give people um, not enough privacy, you have all these harms. If you give people too much privacy, then we can't do any, then we can't do useful um, we can't do useful data science on, on private data. And so like, again, we're going to see that maybe, maybe some of these technologies might be able to let us do both have, uh, do, do data science on top of sensitive data while at the same time preserving privacy, which feels very counterintuitive, but actually turns out to be quite possible, po quite possible. And then this lost natural income is another problem. And we're not going to, th this, this, uh, this last these last two problems, lost natural income and you know power concentration, are not very are not so much in the scope of the class, and so we're not going to talk about them that much. But I just want to mention them. Um, there's been a lot of work, and going back to early internet, people have been talking about this in the early internet. The idea that that when you create data, you're creating something which is valuable, right? Other that's why companies collect it. It's valuable in aggregate. And so it's a little bit of, um, of a pity that, that when users create data, that that isn't treated as a labor in the sense, a labor which should be paid, you know, because people are generating something valuable, but they're not getting to, um, they're not getting to share in the value created by, uh, by this data. And so that's a problem. Someone like Jaron Lanier has been talking about this for a long time. Uh, maybe some people have seen uh, those talks and lots of people are. And then power concentration. So, you know, there's a few major tech companies which hold all the data and they have massive leverage over startups. It's very difficult for a startup to get started because they just don't have the, the, the data. You know, Facebook is, is by now, you know, it, it has such a monopoly on the social graph of people that it's very difficult for a, um, a, another, um, a, a, another social media website in the same space to get any traction because why would anyone join it? No one's on it, right? And then why would anyone be on it if no one's joining it? So you have this problem of network effects, which which is which we're very much stuck in unless we unless we get into a new model of things. Um, so um, so okay, getting so now now I want to pose this question with respect to machine learning. Um, the and, and this this again this is related to the last two problems. The fact that a, um, you know, the, the, this problem with data concentration means that a lack of the data, in particular the lack of the data, but, but also just, you know, like other resources, computation expertise, limits the capabilities of a small autonomous community, right? And so the question is, can a peer-to-peer -peer network of autonomous communities pooling resources together replace the central server? So in other words, like we can't, you know, like well, if I made a social media website, um, I can't really compete with Facebook. But if I made a social media website that that I, that you copy, that everyone copies, that basically we create a bunch of small ones, which have a way of sharing their data together, can we sum together to compete with Facebook on in terms of social data? You know, that's just as, a, as an example, maybe you can use a Google example. Can we pool together our resources to, um, to compete in the scale of Google? And, um, and if we did so, would it be better? Um, and so this is kind of a question that's going to be the backdrop of, 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 of you know, the, this class, essentially. 
Um, now I want to uh, now again like just to just to now now I'm going to try to describe decentralized machine learning, and um, and so in order to describe decentralized machine learning, let's just really quickly review the centralized machine learning model, right? And and I had a picture of this before. I'm going to review it in a few steps. You have a user population, you have a company which you know AI Incorporated is training machine learning models, and um, we can replace this with a decentralized model in which now instead of uh, instead of a company holding the model instead we we all hold the model or at least we all have access to it Let, let's just say for now we all have a copy of the model and what we do but by the way uh, for the for if it's not clear this is a neural network so m most of you have probably seen this if you've taken a neural aesthetic i'm using it as a symbol for for a machine learning model right so a machine learning model is something that that now in this context each of the user populations we all hold it right and maybe we have a, our own copy or maybe we have a, the same copy but the point is that we're cooperating on training it and we're cooperating on training it through the cloud and the idea is that uh, the way that the way that that works is that um, in a, a with, with something called federated learning okay oh, let, let me just back up I know it's a little confusing so just again like centralized learning decentralized learning so what are some technologies that can um, that can get us to this decentralized learning right like how can how can we do decentralized learning so one technology which exists which helps helps us get towards some semblance of decentralized machine learning is something called federated learning um, and I'm gonna describe what federated learning is <clears throat> I'll just mention quickly that that Ideas about federated learning have been around for a long time, um, for at least as long as we've been talking about both machine learning and networks. Um, but the term federated learning actually only goes back to I think 2016, uh, something like that. Um, and and it was and it was and it was actually funny enough that despite you know despite everything, what it was actually uh, an area that Google uh, named. So Google gave federated learning its name. And um, Google is very interested in federated learning, not necessarily for the exact same reasons that I am or we are, um, but they're interested in federated learning, and so they're leading a lot of the research into it, along with many, along with many other individuals and companies. So the premise of federated learning is this: AI Incorporated, instead of instead of having you send your databases to them, your actual raw data, and then having them train the model centrally, and then send us, you know. The results of that model instead in federated learning AI incorporated will make a copy of the model and then send it to all, send the model to all of us so that when we when we use the model when we do services off the model we do it locally right it's not a cloud service we actually do it locally and then while we use those services we can optimize them for ourselves through feedback we can train them so basically as we use these services we we are training those machine learning models a little bit on our own data and then we can send back to ai incorporated updates to the model so so basically learning updates so instead of these um this graphic represents what are called gradients gradients are um, in the context of machine learning, a gradient represents a learning update. It's a change to the internal parameters of the model to make the model slightly better. Uh, the term gradient descent, the gradient descent is the, is the algorithm which is used to train a machine learning model. And when you do gradient descent, you are, you are generating gradients. And so what you can do is, in federated learning, each of the users generates their own gradients sends them to AI Incorporated, and AI Incorporated will use those gradients to update the model and make it better. Um, now maybe they average the gradients, or maybe they, they have some more clever strategy for, for combining them, but the point is that AI Incorporated is still doing the model updating, but, um, but there's, a, there's a big difference now between this and centralized machine learning, which is that AI Incorporated is now no longer receiving the raw data. So that's one step towards towards decentralization and 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 certainly one step towards privacy. It turns out, however, that federated learning by itself is not enough for privacy, um, for reasons that we'll get into later. 
Um, and also, it's not, it's certainly not enough to decentralization because AI Incorporated still, is still the sort of owner of the data. Um, this, introdu this even introduces some new problems with that, but it certainly doesn't, it doesn't fully solve, it doesn't fully solve all of these problems. Um, but it is a step because basically what we obtain from this is a situation where now users don't have to send their data back to, back to AI Incorporated. Um, now, um, I, I mean, I don't mean to be cynical, but what I always like to point out that one of the reasons why Google is incentivized to do federated learning research is not so much because Google cares that much about privacy from a, from a sort of, you know, benefic beneficence of the, or benevolence to the user perspective, but, but because Google is limited in what kind of data it can, it can have users sent to them because of wiretapping laws. So you can't have a phone, you know, you can't, if an iPhone's microphone or camera is on, it can't send everything to Google because it's illegal. It, you know, you can't, it's called wiretapping. <laughs> and so uh, to Google, there's a certainly a one, you know, very good incentive to, to try to um, do federated learning is that um, now you can do machine learning on data, which you do not have to acquire which means that you do not have to violate wiretapping laws. And so for better or worse, that's, that's one of the reasons why Google would do this kind of research. Also because people at Google internally care about privacy. I, I definitely don't want to besmirch my many friends at Google. Um, certainly privacy is, is something that, that many people, including Google, understands the, and, and respects the, the need for. Um, but, um, but also like, yeah, well, I'm sure I, I'm sure the research wouldn't be quite as fast paced if 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 those wiretapping laws weren't in place. In any case, um, this by itself does not ensure privacy. We'll we'll, we'll talk about why. Um, probably we'll talk about why in more detail in in um, week three uh, when we talk a little bit about more about federated learning and multi party competition. Um, the short answer is that these gradients can actually reveal a lot more about you than than we think. Um, even without sending the the um, the original data, these gradients are somewhat informative um, about private private data, and so there's there's we're going to have to make more steps to this. So yeah, as I'm and just uh, sum, summing up, federated learning does not guarantee privacy. Now we have this new problem that the model is out in the open, and so it can be it could be copied, um, and so maybe Google doesn't want that. Um, the lost natural income problem is, is sort of not addressed at all. The data oligopoly problem is not, not only is not solved either. Um, and, and also this is kind of a joke, but, but it's, it's, you know, it's kind of funny that this has to be, um, th th this is also drains your batteries. Um, I want to quickly pause and, and ask if, um, if I'm coming through to everyone, I got to note that my internet connection is unstable. Do people, can you give me, can people give me a thumbs up if you're, if you hear me okay? And see me okay okay so so mostly okay yeah the, the slides have been visible okay just if anyone if uh, if if if, uh, if at some point you begin to experience disconnections or anything like that um, then um, then just alert me because um, I, I want to make sure everyone's hearing everything's coming through the internet connection it, but in any case this is all being recorded um, and so hopefully it's not a big issue, but hopefully everything's, everything's going okay. Um, yeah, does anyone have any, I'll take the moment to just to pause and ask if anyone has any questions or comments. Okay, 240. Obviously you can see that the whole class in 60 minutes is, is already like well more than 60 minutes. The way. Go on, go ahead. Gene, I had a quick question about about the way that runway works and you can like train the model is that kind of the same thing that you're talking about or you can train the model on your computer and then it'll like you can share it back to runway if you want. um no not not quite because uh in in that case you're just training your own model uh, you're you're doing the whole thing and then you're just you're uploading it to a centralized to to a certain to a place federated means that multiple clients um, are, are training the same model, the same model. So like in runway, you can train your own generative model, but imagine if 20 of us trained the same generative model that, that we sort of pooled our data together. Um, so the quite, you know, like, so actually this is, this is a good, I, I kind of like, let, let, let's use that as a concrete example. 
in, in when you use runway and we'll do this next week um, um, when you use runway right you get your data set and you train a model on your data set right what if like what if we train the model and all of our data sets combined how would we do that right well so the most obvious way of doing that is we we take all our data and we put it together in one place you know maybe we all send it to one of us or or you know into a into a shared Google Drive or something like that and then we train the model right but this isn't but federated learning means that the the data should never leave any of the devices so if there's 20 of us each of us has a little piece of, of the data that is the full data set and the model travels around to each of us we train a little bit almost like in batches on our data that you know you train on your data then you move it to the next person they train on their data move it to the next person train on their data and so on and this is effectively similar the same should be the similar or the same result as centralizing all of our data at once from the beginning and then training on training from that data um, so this is this is the idea of federated learning yeah. Good questions. Any, any, any others? Just looking at my slides, I'm going to see kind of, okay, so we're doing pretty good. I think, yeah, I think we're, we're doing well. Okay. So, the, so I'm going to get back to the slides and, um, get, get back into the question. In the chat. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, Aditya asks, I don't know if it, uh, oh, sorry. Um, Oh, there's more questions. Okay. The meaning of, okay. So yeah, uh, Vibert shared, um, an essay from Vitalik Buterin, who's the, who's the creator of Ethereum, who, um, who wrote an essay a couple, I think a couple of years. I remember reading this essay also about the meaning of decentralization. Definitely. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. This is, this is a nice article. I would encourage people to read the article that, that Vibert shared. Um, Lynn says in this model, in this model would verifying the quality of the data from the individual contributors be an issue also? Um, uh, yes. So, so Lynn's question, uh, would the quality, verifying the quality of data from the individual contributors be an issue also? So yes, it is. Um, and so there have been, um, and, and I'm, I'm gonna have to, I, we probably can't answer this question right now in too much detail because we haven't talked enough about how federated learning works but um but the solutions proposed to that is that it so for it are, are a little bit also case specific so for example if you're if the people are are cooperating over a um a, a machine learning a supervised machine learning model which means that that it's that it that you have some date some label some basically um like a data set which has a proper label you can actually measure if the data that you're receiving is, um, or, or basically you can measure if the gradients that you're receiving actually improve the model. Um, so that only works in, so then if you, if they're not, then you can throw them out and, 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 you know, not, you know, and then basically reject, um, data that's, that's not useful. Um, because people, people can just make up their gradients, right? So there are, but in principle, it's true that this is a question that you, ha that you now have to face, you know, what, what happens if you don't trust you know, the, the gradients that you're receiving? So um, in supervised learning, that's a ge generic way of answering that is that you can measure if it actually gives you an improvement or not. Um, in something like unsupervised learning, it's, a, it's an open question. So like if we're doing a generative model, which is an unsupervised learning problem, um, you don't, there's not necessarily a very good way. There's ways of evaluating generative models, there's ways of evaluating GANs. And so maybe you can, you can try to fit something like that. Uh, but as of now, it's, it's, I would say it's probably an open question. Um, and so right now these systems only sort of work at a small scale where, where we, you basically do trust everybody. Um, in, in there's, it, it should be possible to, to create ways of, of mitigating, um, this, this, um, verifying the quality, you know, problem. Um, but yeah, good question. Um, Fanny, uh, Fanny said it's lagging a bit. Uh, um, I just want, am I still lagging for, is there, is there anyone for whom that's true? Okay. Um, Fanny, if you're experiencing that, if you're the only one experiencing that, maybe your internet connection might be suspect. Okay. Um, in any case, like if it is lagging, hopefully like the recording will, will, um, will make up for that. 
Uh, DTA asks, um, can federated systems be puppetized if certain individuals have disproportionate number of nodes? Um, yes, of course. Um, so that's like the bit, you know, Bitcoin's problem. Um, you know, in in and and certainly like so there there you know you you would have to yeah you'd have to either adopt a, some kind of a, a solution that existing decentralized systems or blockchains use you know proof of work proof of stake or whatever um, you you almost get a natural you know with machine learning because machine learning already requires a lot of computation that's that you could potentially just bootstrap on top of that right so if you have a ton, a ton of nodes well you you do need a lot of computation to to be able to do the learning on all of those systems so maybe that's a natural barrier to um to that but um but otherwise i think you do have to you do have to adopt other systems that try to ensure that there's no um no funny business of that sort all good questions okay so um so now I want to very quickly, so I introduced federated learning and I, I want to introduce the other pillar of, um, of, of the uh, decentralization component. Again, we'll talk about this a little bit in more detail in week three, but I'll just introduce it now. And, and I want to start, I want to start by saying that secure multi-party computation is an area that I barely understand myself. And I want to make this clear because um, it's a very, first of all, it's a very new field in general. Uh, it's 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 maybe it's not super new with respect to simple kinds of computations, but for with respect to machine learning, it's very new. And I mean, one year, like one or two years, this kind of stuff. Um, there's no existing systems that that do it at scale. Um, we'll we'll talk about one library which is being developed that does that that is being developed to do it. But otherwise, secure multi-party computation with in machine learning is an emerging field. There's no textbooks. There's no um, there, there's, there's hardly even any papers that review it. It's a really, really, um, exciting uh, emerging new field. So I'm, I'm, this is one of the reasons why this component of the class is so impractical is that, um, these are, again, it's like a one year old field. And so we're really kind of like, we're, we're trying to be as current as we can. And so to keep up at the frontier means that certain things become a little bit less, a little bit more cloudy. That's something that I've, I've been kind of like observing in, in keeping up with AI. It's always the case that when you're on the, when you're trying to hook onto whatever's at the forefront, it, it can feel very, yeah, it can feel very tenuous. In any case, it's a, it's a super interesting uh, field. I'm learning about it myself and I'm hoping maybe to, to the degree that people get interested in it, we can learn about it together. Um, so what is, what is secure multi-party computation? Um, so, so, so first of all, like let, let um, before I get into this example, um, let me let me define secure multi-party computation. The idea of secure multi-party computation is is it's a way for multiple nodes in uh, in the network to trustlessly again that there's that word again trustlessly. You you don't you don't have to trust that that any of the other you you have to I think in most existing systems you have to trust that at least one other person is authentic i think either one other person it could it could even be it, depending on the system it might either be one other person or 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 you don't even need to trust that but the idea is that that without trust a way of multiple um nodes in the computer network to do a computation together that's the multiple party multi-party computation part in such a way that it that it either um, it, that it either obscures the the input data or the the um, the actual computation itself. Um, now, and, and it's useful in cases where where there is a security component where you where that where one of those one or both of those things need to be hidden. So let me give you an example. Um, so, uh, let, oh, this is uh, I'm sorry. This is super, I, I, this is a typo. I started in one example and then I changed to another example. Let's calculate our total salary without sharing our individual salaries. Yeah. So I started with heights and then I, I changed to salaries and then I left one half the sentence unchanged. Okay. So imagine, imagine we're taking a census, like we're doing a study on all of the people at ITP and we want to uh, calculate 
what is the average salary of all the people who are who are at ITP? Either all of the students or all of the you know all of the faculty or whoever. It doesn't matter. The point is that we want to we want to calculate what is our GDP. You know our our our, our gross product here as as a collection of people and we want to do that we want to like all of us are interested in knowing that but uh, there's a problem which is that the amount of individual money that you make you know maybe that's maybe it's a secret maybe it's you don't want to divulge that right um so so how do we is there a way that we can figure out how much money we collectively make so that we all know how much money we all have without uh, telling any anybody else the our individual salaries so that's that's an interesting problem and it gets to what we were talking about earlier like can you do a computation on private data while re, while keeping that data private so um, it turns out with secure multi-party computation that you can there are mechanisms for doing this which which um, which rely only on uh, which which are which basically um, okay, so I think I think the the best claim I can make is that um, that they're secure in the sense that they do not leak your uh, data as long as at least one other node is authentic. Um, they they may be not secure in the sense that um, in the sense that they'll give you the correct answer. I think more is needed to to do that, but they're at least secure in the sense that they guarantee privacy. Um, in, in the, the following protocol. So here's here's one protocol that you could use to do this exact calculation. So here, let's say we have three people and their salaries are 72, 56, and 64 dollars. And so we want to calculate what, what that is, right? So that's 72 plus 56 plus 64. Total salary is 192, right? And so the 192 is our total salary and 64 is the, is the average, right? So how do we do that? So the protocol would involve doing this. Each of those three parties would split their salary into three random numbers that add up to their salary, right? So basically, so the way you could do that is that you would just get two random numbers. So let's say this person one gets negative 46 and 88, and then you can calculate what the third piece should be by just subtracting the sum of these from 72, right? So you get, so, so you basically, split your salary into three numbers which add together to the correct salary but do not but um but uh by themselves each piece is sort of like random meaningless essentially um so each of them does that and then what they do is they send like each person sends one of the one of the three shares to the other two parties so you can see i've color coded them right so this person a will take their uh 88 in orange and send it to person C and person B will take their negative 46 um, wait did I shade that correctly is that right 88 I think I might have the shading wrong 46 oh no no, no that's that's correct okay so then basically person 2 sends 11 to person a sorry let's let's back up so person this person right here will send this is what I messed up I messed up this this color coding okay for the color coding is a little bit wrong I'll fix that but the point is that this person sends their shares two of the three shares they send to the other two people and then each of them do that so they basically just swap their shares with each other so that at, at the end of the swapping each person has one of their three shares and one share from each of the other two and then what they do is they simply sum those together. Um, so these are summed together. And then, then they can jointly sum the sum of their sums. And then that gives them 192, which is the original answer that we got. And in this process, no one ever had enough information to recover the salary of any of the other, any of the other two individuals. So this is a, a way of doing. This is a. This is called multi-party computation for the operation of addition. So it, it turns out that if all you're doing is adding numbers together, then um, then this is actually quite easy. You simply you can do this procedure. So adding numbers together with multiple parties, which in which you in which you do not want to um, 
in which you do not want to uh, share the actual data itself um, can be, if all you're doing is adding, can be done very simply this way. Does everyone understand, understand this, this procedure? So this is secure multi-party computation for addition. Um, we'll talk about, um, so for short, SMPC, so secure multi-party computation, SMPC, or MPC sometimes. Um, SMPC is, uh, is, an, is an emerging study in cryptography. It's a way of doing cryptography. Um, and, um, and you can do it for some operations easier than others. Uh, so for addition, it's straightforward, addition and subtraction. There are ways of doing it for multiplication too. The, the protocol for multiplication is more complicated though. Um, it, it can be done though. Um, there are some operations which are extreme, some operations are extremely difficult. So for example, to do um, a, a, compa a com comparison between two numbers. So let's say, let's say you and I wanted to figure out who has more money, right? Like, like let's say person A and person B want to know which, which party has more money than the other without sharing the actual amount of money. So you can do that with SMPC too, but the protocol for that, as simple as the actual underlying operation sounds, is actually really complicated. Um, there's not, there's, there's, it's, it's, it turns out to be very difficult to do that without doing just a bit, you know, just revealing. Um, and now, so the, the connecting this back to machine learning, machine learning, you know, is nothing more than a series of many operations done in parallel. Um, and those operations involve additions, multiplications, also activation functions next in the second week. Next week, we'll talk more about neural networks. Um, do a review of neural networks and so on. So we'll see the mechanics of neural networks. But for now, it's sufficient to say that neural networks have a bunch of these operations that we need to be able to do SMPC on in order to apply SMPC to, to, to machine learning. Um, and, um, and yeah, and it, it gets pretty, it gets pretty hairy, but, but that's the, that's the, yeah, like an intro, a, a small introduction to SMPC. Um, now, if you could do SMPC on a neural network, then potentially you could use it to to actually distribute the neural network itself. Now, in, in the example that I showed you, that was just used to keep the um, to to basically um, uh, preserve the privacy of the internal data. But SMPC could also be used to keep the privacy of the neural network itself, like the parameters of the of the model. The weights and so on, um, because the, that's just an, it's just well th those also need to be those are also just the the factors of the of the computation. So it turns out that potentially, if you know that, that that if this technology were applied correctly and at scale, you could potentially use it to preserve you uh, to to make the network itself uh, private. So and when I say private, private from who? Private from everybody. So imagine that. These, uh, what is it, 11 people are jointly holding a neural network in such a way that they do not have all of the information necessary to do a full forward pass through the network. And I, I'm sorry, I'm using a lot of tech, uh, terminology that, that um, those of you who are unfamiliar with machine learning may not, uh, may not already be familiar with. Forward pass, um, for example, activation functions. I'll, I will be introducing those um, more in in um, next week. They uh, you can also watch the the uh, from from the neural aesthetic. There we we go into these into detail. So you you can also um, if you're interested you can you can look that stuff up um, in those videos. But I will be introducing this in more detail next week. Um, in any case, like the 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 only point for now is is that. Um, it is in principle possible for uh, the computation to be the for the neural network to be such that to to do any computation through it requires everybody, um, and that's the and, and also that no individual can do the computation alone. Um, so that's very interesting, right? So that that's getting to that's getting close to what we are we're kind of interested in, right? Which is which is this you know de decentralized you know machine learning. Right, and the, uh, which is a prerequisite for the autonomous artist concept. Um, so, some applications of SMPC, generally speaking, guaranteed privacy between providers and consumers, 
Um, a lot of the most like low hanging fruits, so to speak, are, are consortium use cases. So for example, imagine a consortium is like a collection of companies. So it doesn't have to be peer to peer, you know, individuals, it could be companies, for example, that want to that want to keep their data secret from each other. So maybe 10 uh, hospitals want to be able to pool their their patient data together in order to learn something interesting from that data but they do not want to share that data with each other either because of regulations or you know because of privacy concerns whatever um you know but but could they learn something from that data because what we know from machine learning is that the more data you have the better your application gets it just learns more there's more to learn from and so you know it's it's a huge bottleneck in order to be not able to create these data sets because of the um effectively because of uh, because of regulations and so a consortium could get around this potentially using smpc and then peer-to-peer -peer networks turning computation into a public good this is this is this is like i think i wrote that sentence a little while ago <laughs> um well the that that's that's exactly what what we're going to be doing with the aaa so let's let's just get into that and then the question for me like getting getting back to the autonomous artists is that can such a can such a peer-to-peer -peer network collaborating over some competition make art and you know would it be art actually and so you know let's suppose that our model is split into a secure multi-party computation grid and then in order to uh, it, and then we use that grid to train a generative model on pictures on artworks on music on text whatever it is and then can a uh you know can someone then can can we sample artworks from this computational grid right and this is basically what the autonomous artificial artist is um sort of you know finally getting getting to it um and 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 of course i shouldn't say that this is this is at least one way of doing it it's the way that i think is the most it, it seems to be the most feasible right now i've explored other ideas i'd be curious like you know what other constructions might might be used to satisfy the, the the original criteria but this is sort of like the getting finally getting to the punchline what the autonomous artificial artist is so um now i, I want to quickly mention this this whole uh this whole subject i have been trying to study this in the context of a project that i call abraham i've been doing this for the last two and a half to three years um, and I've made extremely little progress. So for I, 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 um, the class um, is not on Abraham specifically, but I want to mention Abraham right now because Abraham is like the project, this art project that I've been using to explore this. And so to the extent that I'll be developing on it further in the future, it'll be, it'll be kind of here. Um, and so I encourage, like if anyone gets inspired enough to like really get into this idea, I'd be super curious to hear what, what takes people have on it you know what they might be able to help the reason why it's called abraham there's kind of two there's kind of two um two connections one is that um it, it's connected oh, i think i have a slide yes i have a slide uh, the next slide first let me mention this next slide um this is the first reason why it's called abraham so who knows what this is what 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 what's in the slides is anyone familiar with this this project anybody okay so this is a project called Aaron. Um, I'm going to type that in. Aaron, all capital letters. And it's by um, a, an artist named Harold Cohen, who, who died about two years ago, I think two or three years ago now. And um, Harold Cohen was one of the first sort of computer artists to, um, maybe the first, I think, uh, to, to basically try to make uh, an AI program that made art on its own. And, um, and he called it Aaron. And he basically, he made a drawing robot that, um, that he hand programmed all of these rules into to make, uh, to make art. Let me just see how I'm doing on time because this is actually going, this actually might take up the whole class. Um, and so like I actually, this is why I, I really, I put the thing into, <laughs> into question marks. So it's 3.07, we stop in eight minutes. Holy moly, okay. Okay, well, I'm almost. I'm pretty much almost done, but but I will. I'll probably have to. I'll punt a little bit of this stuff. Actually, actually, we're doing pretty well. 
this is fine. Okay, good. Um, so, so let me just mention this, and then we'll and then we'll break. Um, so, so the the idea of Aaron was to uh, to basically uh, he hand programmed all of these rules, and they were some, they were sort of random rules. They were stochastic, and they were kind of like embedded with some randomness, and so they would make artworks, right? And um, and originally Harold Cohen uh, said that Aaron was supposed to be the first one of these that he made. He was going to devote his life to to making to making a bunch of these robots that would make art and that he would name them alphabetically. So he started with Aaron, AA, and then it would just continue onwards. And I I'm quite inspired by this project. You know, I've always been interested in AI arts. I found this project to be very inspiring and so I thought Abraham was was really like the second, you know, name I think would have been a good choice for the second um, the second robot that he would have made, he never got to it though, because he basically spent his whole life, pretty much like 30 or 40 years working on just Aaron <laughs> and then he died. Um, and so, and so like he never kind of got to the, to the second one. So Abraham is in some ways an homage, um, to it. There's a second reason, which is that it's actually, it, it is, um, it is a, a little bit of a, a strange, um, uh, reference to the biblical figure, of course, you maybe maybe you've noticed that this is looks like a Ethereum logo in the in the Star of David shape. Um, there's a connection that I make using an interpreta a psychological interpretation of religion that I write about in the initial essay to Abraham. It's not important to this class because um, because this class is not about Abraham per se. It's about the the construction of the autonomous artificial artist. But for anyone who's interested, if you go to Abraham.ai, there's a link to the first essay which describes this. Anyway. Um, um, I also mentioned briefly earlier artificial life. So some of the precedents, some of the antecedents to this to this study, artificial life is this is the field that's concerned with you know basically simulation of biological like computer agents which 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 mate and breed and all of this kind of stuff. And so this is also a sort of an influence that 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 we're that we're kind of going on top of. Um, I also want to mention electric sheep. Maybe some of you know this project is made by uh, someone named Scott Draves. The idea of electric sheep is 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 basically where it's a screensaver that is generated by the combined computational power of a network of volunteers while their computers sleep. Um, and so electric sheep is is basically a good example of crowdsourced art. And there's no machine learning component to it, but it but it's it's a nice um, influence on this. I'm also influenced by simulation. So this is you're looking at like Sim City, um, Sim Life. These are games by Will Wright, The Sims. Um, there's a kind of, there's a really interesting sort of, um, like emergent behavior that comes out of small interacting agents. And so this is kind of very much like, I think in parallel to some of the themes that we're exploring in this class. And then the most recent thing is this wave of AI arts that I've been a part of. I've been really fortunate to, to, to get to know a lot of the artists in this space. Um, AI art is kind of just like the use, more or less the use of deep learning for, for making visual arts and so on, and so this is kind of also an influence on this space. And uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna pause there. We'll, we're gonna get into the the AI art ne next week. We're gonna basically talk about AI arts. So I'm gonna introduce machine learning more properly, um, a, a sort of review of neural networks. We'll talk about generative models and AI arts, and then we'll we'll get into it. We're gonna do a tutorial on generative models. I'm thinking to bring in some runway and collab into that so so next week we're going to kind of get away a little bit from the autonomous artificial artist concept and away from decentralization to just focus on now now that we've got the whole idea out there i want to now begin to attack each of the individual components and then later in the class we'll kind of get to combining them um, and so that's going to be um that that will be so next week will just be kind of like next week will be like a micro neural aesthetic it's going to be very much a review of the kind of stuff that we were doing in the neural aesthetic and um, with some connection to the, the bigger concept, but mostly kind of just focused on AI art more broadly. And then we're going to talk about decentralization stuff in week three, and then it'll start to bring it back together. Um, I just want to go to the last slide. I wanted to um, pose a, let's see here, um, all the way down. Where did I put it actually? Ah, yep, here. Um, so yeah, for next week, basically we're going to talk about generative models, AI arts. I also, I also want to maybe, I think I've already done this, so this might be a very small component, but talk a little bit about this idea of crowdsourced collaborative art. Um, 
and then um, and then the like for assignments um, so the, the way that we're going to do assignments in this class is still kind of an ongoing thing this class is going to be sort of tricky to do like a final project on the way it is to do in the neural aesthetic because it's so short um, and also because it's so much less practical than the neural aesthetic so I'm going to instead of doing assignments we'll probably sorry instead of doing like a final project we'll probably do micro projects um, this first one should be kind of an easy one so here's what I'd like for everyone to do I'd like for you to just do a little bit of research and present your fate and I want everyone to to maybe like we'll, we'll, we'll devote a few minutes of the class next week to um, just showing like your favorite example of some artwork or a creative project which exemplifies collaboration like especially on a massive scale or crowdsourcing so think of like artworks that involve that involve many people and uh, and maybe not many people but but like multiple people and that the artwork is a is a sort of man is sort of like a like manifest that whole collective right so and i, I just meant to mention yesterday like uh, by total coincidence like some of my friends here who who i'm sharing this whole space with there um they're playing um uh um exquisite corpse so maybe some of you know exquisite corpse i would look it up if you don't know um exquisite corpse is is a game in which you basically um uh, you make a drawing together right so it's sort of like um look it up basically if you don't know what that is you basically create a drawing together by folding up a piece of paper and then drawing some separate sections of it um it's a super interesting pro uh, super interesting idea of like a collaborative art project so i want you to take your favorite example of this and um and please bring it to class and and maybe i'm gonna just go around and ask people um it's a pretty easy assignment so hopefully everyone everyone can kind of like um and and don't you don't have to say too much about it maybe maybe even if you have a picture you could show that would be awesome but uh, otherwise you can just talk about it um and, and or or if you have a like if you want to bring in links links are also good so if you have a link that you can talk about i can put it on the screen and, and screen share it and then also um oh um and then optionally it, I, I would check out these tutorials from um from the neural aesthetic We'll be kind of reviewing this next week, but if you want to get a head start in it, these are just some of the tutorials on generative models and, and, and using a terminal more generally that might help you get a head start in this class. We'll be reviewing some of this stuff in, in, um, in the following, um, yeah, in, in next week. Um, so, so that's it. The last thing I'll say is I'm going to, oh yeah, yes, uh, that's exactly what I was going to talk about. Where can we find these links? Is there a class site? There will be a class site and the slides will be up today like i will i will make sure that those are up um the the lecture i might need one day to figure out how to where it is exactly but um but this the syllabus and these slides will be uploaded uh by the end of the day so and then when when it is i will email everybody um okay good are there any other, any other questions um just to confirm do you now have our emails or should we send them to you um, if you are not, uh, if you do not appear in the course, in like the course enrollment, then, then please send it to me. Uh, like I'm going to like, like if you, if you're not, if you're not sure, just email me and, I'll, and, for, and then I'll add you. Uh, but yes, like, like if you're not sure that you appear, it would be best to email me. Any, any others? And I'll also announce my office hours when I when I figure them out. For mo most likely, just um, this week will probably be easy, but let's say Wednesday. Um, really, like my office hours in this, it almost don't have any significance now because because we, there's no office, and so really, like to the like people should feel very much in like feel free, please like to in, uh, reach out to me individually, and we can have office hours like more or less every week. Um, if, especially as people get ideas for projects, I'd be very curious to hear what people, you know, what people are interested in this class, especially as we begin to unpack it. Uh, but I will try to have like a formal office hours, you know, maybe because, because it's, because for the sake of scheduling, maybe some people will find that useful. Any other, any others? Okay, great. Okay. Well, that, that's all. So, um, like I said, everything is going to be online soon and I'll, and I'll be contacting you end of the day um thanks everybody and uh have a good the rest of your day thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm.